welcome to the um, probably your least favorite subject in all of ophthalmology and uh, the next five and a half hours that uh, we're going to spend together and we'll try to make it uh, as uh, painless as possible though as you all know the, uh, the optics in itself that's sort of almost impossible to do to try to make it painless as possible so um, we'll just get go ahead and get started so a couple things I have no financial interest in any of the things we're going to talk about, um, but one relevant, um, I, I wrote many of the questions for the uh, popular website Opto questions, so I do receive financial compensation for that. I have some unrelated disclosures with uh, Bosch Alum and Beaver Visitech. All right, a couple of guidelines and disclaimers to get out of the way here. <clears throat> so these lectures are mainly geared for the written qualifying exams. So everybody's here taking the written qualifying exam, right? Nobody's taking the oral boards in two or three weeks, right? Hopefully you're all gonna pass this one, you're gonna be ready to take the oral boards in March or April or something like that. Okay, so good. And the reason for that is that the optics for the written boards is completely different than the optics for the oral boards, okay. So why study optics? So the optics questions are worth the same amount of points as all of the other questions on the exam. So it's not like they only give half a point if you get an optics question right and you get three points for kind of getting a retina or a cornea question right. So the same number of points and the reason for that here is that I want to teach you optics so you pass the exam and possibly use it in your clinical practice. I'm not going to try to make you a Jedi master of optics, okay? So the way that I've taught it now for the past couple of years is with a lot of mnemonics, a lot of shortcuts, and in some ways to sort of dumb down the material at times. And students have been very responsive to that approach because I think optics as a subject is very dry and abstruse. And so I try to make it a little bit entertaining and fun. So, but sometimes, you know, some people may feel that I'm kind of dumbing the subject matter down. So hopefully your sensibilities won't be too offended with that. Um, as a result, I'm gonna teach this in a very common sense way. I think a lot of the optics textbooks out there, or even lectures that you may hear from other people, are by people uh, written by or are written by or are given by people who are much smarter than me. So I figured, you know, years ago when I was a first year resident and I took my OCAPs, you know, confessions, I got a 5% on my OCAPs on optics. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm a reasonably intelligent person, people like me, that sort of thing. And why am I doing so bad on this? And I realized that all of the textbooks and lectures that are given there are written by or are given by people who are incredibly smart. I'm like, I've got limited brain cells, and so I need to dumb this down and make it understandable in a way to me. And so I kind of have retaught optics to myself. And over the years now, that's the way I've taught it to uh, you know, my junior colleagues, okay? Of course, the BCSC is the final arbiter. Um, Feel, uh, please feel free to stop me and ask questions anytime. We got off to a little bit of a late start, so there's some of the questions which I may uh, skip through. Some of the, you know, like when we get to like some of the lens and mirror questions, you know, there's several examples in there, so I may just do like one or two examples instead of like all three or four of those examples, so that we make up some time. But if you want me to stop and uh, you know go over some things, please feel free to raise your hand or interrupt me at any time. Okay. There may be several ways to solve a particular problem. As long as you get the correct answer, there's no style or elegance point. So if you feel a certain way of doing a calculation makes sense to you, or by using meters, for example, rather than centimeters makes sense to you, that's fine. This isn't like Olympic figure skating where you gotta impress the judges and you know the French judge, I think, will always give you the lower points. No, as long as you kind of click on the stupid correct box, you'll get the same number of points. So, if you have a different way in your head that makes sense to you, that you're able to get to the right answer, um, that's fine. So for some of the problems, I'm gonna try to show several methods um, to, to solve the same problem, but then I will usually tell you which method I think makes sense. So for example, when we do lens questions, I think it's easier to keep everything in hundreds and work in centimeters rather than working in decimals and meters. Uh, I'm only gonna cover topics I think on the exam. And this is kind of a big thing. you know. You know, most of the topics and most of the questions are based on a limited number of concepts and topics, okay? Uh, Genentech is not spending millions of dollars to try to figure out a new way to solve U plus D equals V, okay? So it's the same concepts that have been there for like the past 30 years, and all they do every single year is they basically change the numbers to each question so that the equations kind of, you're still using the same equations, but the numbers may be slightly different. So the, why that's important is like, whereas, you know, with new research, new developments, new studies, 
in like cornea, retina, glaucoma especially. There's so much more knowledge that you have to know compared to like five years ago. Optics really hasn't changed in the past 10 years. Okay, so all they're gonna do is they're gonna change the numbers or add a few wrinkles. Obviously, if you're absolutely clueless, um, guess and move on. The other thing here is that the calculations are meant to be simple. As you know, um, when you took your OCAPs recently, those of you who recently finished training or um, recently took a, you know, one of these ophthalmic standardized exams, you can't um, take a calculator with you. So the calculations are meant to be simple. If all of a sudden you're finding yourself kind of doing complicated long division or one of your calculations generates like a square root of a minus number, then you probably have kind of set it up wrong. You may have flipped the denominator and numerator or vice versa. So if you are doing these problems and realizing all of a sudden, oh my gosh, my head hurts from trying to do this math, stop and realize maybe you're plugging the numbers in the wrong place or maybe you're using the wrong equation. So if you're doing complicated math, stop and recheck your equations and numbers. Okay, a couple of acknowledgments for two of my colleagues who've helped over the years with slides. All right, low yield topics for the written exam are basically everything here. And the reason I put it here is because sometimes many people, when they're studying for oral boards, will look some of this stuff up. Now, ironically, okay, if, and I'm going to be giving the oral boards lecture in two weeks, um, it's, this is all high yield for the oral boards. But for the written boards, it's not. Okay? So stuff that you would discuss rather than calculate, don't worry. Okay? You can go nuts on, the, on this four to six months now from now on this stuff. These are all low yield uh, uh, op, uh, topics for the WQE. All right. Here is the equation uh, or the slide full, filled with equations that I've kept at the beginning. So that way, you know, like the night before the uh, WQE, this is the sheet of equations that you want to memorize. You have to know these kind of cold. And hopefully as we go through our little journey this afternoon, I'm going to try to point out when you're going to use a certain equation um, and when you're going to use a different one. So again, there's really no way of getting around some of these. Um, I've just tried to put these all here in the beginning. So again, you have a kind of a one summary slide for everything. There's not too many of them that you have to memorize, but you've hopefully seen some of these before. All right, here's the outline of topics that we're going to try to cover here in the next few hours. And again, we're going to try to get caught up here and try to get through all of these things here. All right, let's talk a couple, a couple things about some basic principles. So there's different worlds in the, in the universe of, of optics. So though I like to think of it, those of you who have seen the movie Interstellar, is that there's different planets in the movie and each of those planets have their own laws, right? On one planet, the time may run in a certain speed versus another planet, time runs at a different speed. So in the world of, in the universe of optics, there's a planet of physical optics, there's a planet of quantum optics, but really geometric optics is the planet that we are going to spend most of our time. This is like the water planet where you end up kind of thinking you're only there for 20 minutes, but it's actually like 20 years. And I think that's kind of beyond spoiler alert because the movie's been out for so long that if you haven't seen it by now, that's not my fault for me kind of spilling that plot detail of the movie. But one of the uh, assumptions that's made in the world of geometric optics is that light will travel in linear rays, okay? We don't make those same assumptions when we're dealing with some of these other planets. So what does that mean? So here we have a point source of light. We're saying that the light rays are going to move in a line in every single direction from that point source of light. Okay, so that is an important assumption to make in order to be able to solve all of these problems ranging from U plus D equals V to Prentice's rule to mirror problems, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to spend too much time over here. This is more um, relevant to things like um, surgical optics when we talk about things like higher order aberrations. But again, most of our time is going to be spent in this world. Okay. So what happens to light rays in geometric optics? Again, we said that they move in a basically a straight line, but another assumption we make is that light rays that travel in a medium are naturally divergent. They kind of want to get away from each other. They don't want to stick together. We artificially consider them parallel when we solve geometric optics problems in order to determine where the image is going to be located, what is the size of the image, um, and then finally, when light rays get affected by an external source, such as a converging lens, a plus lens, the light, light, light rays are going to come together. So when a light ray point, uh, kind of goes through an aperture, what's going to happen is here is our point source of light. There's different light rays going in every single direction. 
And then as the light approaches this aperture, what's going to happen is that some of the light rays are going to continue to diverge, some of them are going to become parallel, and some of them are going to converge. Okay, so keeping in mind that um, for all intents and purposes, when we are dealing with um, solving equations, we're mainly going to be assuming that light rays are going to be parallel, and then when they encounter an object such as a minus-powered lens or a plus-powered lens, they will either diverge or converge, respectively. Okay. A couple of other things here. Light rays in geometric optics. So again, when light rays are traveling along peacefully in a medium, they may, do any of, they, they may do one of the above three things. Again, converge, diverge, or stay parallel. However, when they encounter an object, one or more things may occur. Okay, and I kind of put this on a slide here because a lot of times people use these words interchangeably and they may not know exactly what they mean, what the difference between especially refraction and diffraction. Uh, there's ref so there's refraction, reflection, absorption, diffraction, scattering, and polarization. We're going to spend most of our time talking about refraction, and we'll take a to spend a little bit of time talking about diffraction. But among these topics or these concepts, you really need to know a lot about refraction. And then there's two subtopics under refraction, which are distortion and dispersion. Okay? Reflection we'll start dealing with when we go into the world of mirrors. Absorption you can essentially ignore. Diffraction, if you put in a multifocal lens, that is exactly what is happening. And scattering and polarization is more kind of topics they like to ask for oral boards. But this is kind of explains why is the sky blue uh, at noontime and orange at sunset time, for example. Okay, so again, knowing what these words mean and not kind of um, interchanging them, I think, is, is important. All right, so light rays in geometric optics. We said refraction and reflection are two big ones that are going to happen. So refraction, let's talk a little bit more about it. What does it mean? Refraction simply means that when a light ray goes from one medium into another, that it is going to bend. That light ray is not going to be going straight anymore, it is going to bend. So when it goes from one medium into another, it will bend. So examples like, a, like a, when light ray hits a lens or when sunlight hits a pond, that that light ray will bend. Reflection is pretty easy to remember. It basically says that the light ray, when it hits the medium, it's not going to penetrate through. It's basically going to bounce back. And absorption, as we said, is not important. So here's our light ray. It's kind of traveling along. It's our parallel light ray that we've made that assumption. Now it's going to encounter this barrier. And now one, when this light, some of the light rays are going to bend this way, that's refraction. Okay? Now some of the light rays are going to actually get bent away from the surface. That's like the mirror part. That's reflection. And then absorption, we said, is not as important. Those are lost as heat. So again, refraction, this is really where we are going to spend a lot of time talking about when we talk about lenses, prisms, mirrors. This is really what is happening with refraction. And then when we get to like plano mirrors, this is what's happening with reflection. Okay? All right. <clears throat> So Snell's law of refraction. So Snell's law basically says that it defines how strongly is a light ray going to be bent as it moves from one medium into another. If you know the index of refraction of the two materials, then you can determine the angle of, refra of, of refraction. So if you know the incoming angle and you know the, um, the index of refraction of the two mediums, then you can calculate the um, angle that the light ray will go into the medium. Now, all of that sounds super complicated, and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm already falling asleep. It's after lunch. Well, you don't ever have to calculate this, so relax. Okay? You don't ever have to calculate this. You just have to kind of know what does this mean. Okay, so let's dumb this down. What does that mean? Well, when light rays enter a material with a higher refractive index, so here's our light, li light ray, it's traveling along happily in air, and all of a sudden encounters water, it's no longer going to continue along this straight path. It's going to get bent because it's going from a less dense medium into a more dense medium. And when that happens, it's going to get bent towards the norm. The norm basically is an imaginary line that we establish perpendicular to the two surfaces to determine whether light rays will be bent away from the norm or towards the norm. So in this case, going from air to water is going to be bent towards the norm. So now this light ray, instead of going along here or kind of going along over there, it's going to get bent towards the norm. So it's actually going to look like that. OK? 
Okay, that's all that means. So that's what Snell's law is telling us is that the, the difference in the index of refraction will tell you whether a light ray is going to get bent towards the norm or away from the norm. Similarly, when a light ray is leaving water, because this is a denser medium and now it's going to enter into a less dense medium, it's going to get bent away from the norm. So instead of kind of going along this way and continuing this way, it's going to get bent this way. Okay, that is what you need to know about Snell's law. Don't worry about trying to calculate it and this and that. Um, one more example, think of a toy car hitting a carpet at an angle. So here we've got a toy car, hardwood floor and carpet, two different index of refraction. And now the toy car hits the floor, it's not able to go through anymore, so when it encounters the carpet, it's gonna get bent towards the norm, okay? And now the beam of light, we're thinking here is that the beam of light from one medium, it's not able to go, or it, this is a more denser medium, and so instead of going this way, it's going to get bent down this way, okay? So again, what is it that you need to know is that light rays will be bent to, 